some really, really good talks today besides Augusta. Y'all have fun? Oh, yeah. <laughs> How many of you did Jake Williams talk here next door, uh, uh, you know, last hour? I heard that was absolutely packed. It was about as crowded in here for the, for the competing talk. These have been, it's really been a good day. So thank you, every one of you, for coming out today. We really, really appreciate it. I really, uh, I'm going to have a little bit of fun uh, announcing this next group. So when they submitted, we did our CFP, like what, back in April, right? For East Side Augusta, we did our CFP like quite a while ago. And the four of us all worked together. We all worked roughly around the same product line at Mandia Fire Eye. And uh, at that point, it was, you know, it was going to be pretty cool. They were going to put in this talk, and uh, it was all going to be something all four of us. Fast forward five months, and we all four now work for four different companies. Uh, but Jackie is still a man is. And, uh, uh, I made it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can hear Gloria Gaynor. I will survive. Uh, in there somewhere. Um, anyway, uh, Jackie is Find Evil on Twitter, so I know a lot of you follow her. And then uh, we've got also Stephen Hink. Stephen is now at Oracle. And we have Danny Akoski, who is uh, a former Mandian as well, uh, starts at Bank of America two days from now on their hunting. So uh, really good news to hear about that. So I give you these three guys to talk about hunting and finding evil. You should be hot. Cool. Hi, everybody. Hey. As he said, uh, I'm Jackie Stokes. I'm a principal consultant over at Mandiant. Been with Mandiant for about three years. Prior to that, I spent uh, most of my life in hot, dusty, dangerous places <laughs> doing stuff for the Defense Department. Um, Steve. Hi, I'm Stephen Hink. I'm with Oracle now. Uh, I've done the, kind of the whole range of blue team stuff. SOC cert, running them, building them, involved in them, doing the incident response. Uh, sec ops, you know, deploying firewalls and stuff like that. Previously, IT ops before that. Danny Koski, uh, technically Bank of America as of Monday morning. Um, so I used to work with, as uh, Phil said, all those guys at Mandy and uh, a couple different hunt teams. Spent some time at GE Capital on their hunt team as well, so I've been doing it for a while. Uh, before that, general purpose uh, IT sledgery. Um, so did some network stuff too. Um, but yeah, primarily hunt's kind of been my bread and butter. And can do the same thing as uh, uh, at the back, so I'm excited for it. And super, super happy to be here. Um, if you guys didn't catch Jake Williams' uh, talk, I was just in it. Go check it out afterwards. It was really amazing. Awesome. All right, so uh, we talk about uh, hunting, or actually, let's back up a little bit. We talk about security operations. And we talk about the problem set that hunting could potentially solve, right? We're looking at finding evil. We're looking at ways for evil to do evil things, which are risky, potentially stupid things that are happening in the environment, things your users are doing, um, ways systems uh, are configured, the way the architecture is laid out that create um, wider attack surfaces than you would really want. And uh, we want to use the data that we already have, data that we can get. Uh, and the intent is to make things better. Right? We want to improve things. It's not just, hey, guys, we have uh, a lot of bad things and we have a lot of incidents as a result. We want to feed this information back into security operations and improve the security program overall. So that's what we're here today to talk to you about. So our solution to that, threat hunting, right, is in the abstract. And uh, uh, threat hunting is, is really using the data we have uh, to, to look for ways that we can improve our posture, whether that's kicking bad guys out or preventing them from getting in through different means. Uh, and we want to use use what we find, as Jackie mentioned, to bring it back into the SOC so that we can continue to improve both on the SOC and as the uh, on the security program as a whole. <laughs> yeah, so um, I guess the main point to drive home here is that uh, hunting is, is, is a bad process, it's bad methodology. Your tools will inevitably fall down. Um, and you need to be able to translate your process and your methodologies and your methods of thinking to any tools that you might have at your disposal. Um, so it is not tools, what we're going to hear us say this probably a couple of times, despite the fact that we were with, you know, a beta vendor and all that kind of stuff, and it's Steven still and it's still Jackie. Um, we are tool agnostic, so use what works for you. Uh, it's not about alerts. You don't alert, it's telling you something happened. That, that's triage, right? So in the context of the talk and in the context of hunting in general, 
we think of it as it's not a learning, it's actively going out there and trying to find ways for evil to do evil things. Um, and the end game is the end game is automation, right? So if you're gonna try to find new hunting methodology, you want you don't have to do it over and over again. The end game should be automation, but that's it's not about having a machine telling you something is wrong. It is about the human, it is about using your own experiences to have a good goals. So we talk about building a, uh, I guess I should use a mic, when we talk about building a hunt program, um, there are different foundational aspects of a hunt program or of a security program that you need to look at before you start thinking about building a hunt program on top of that, right? So the very first thing that we're looking at here is a formalized security program, right? Somebody cares about security within your organization, someone is uh, providing some executive sponsorship there, you have some type of budget, some type of resourcing available to tackle this problem within the organization, right? Most of you here hopefully have this in place. Uh, the next thing we want to talk about is a functioning security operations capability and a functioning incident response capability, right? You've got to be able to, uh, you've got to be able to handle the incidents that you have, uh, that are coming in. You've got to be able to detect these incidents. You've got to be able to feed those back into security operations and kind of IT across the enterprise to, to you know, reintegrate that information and make it useful to the rest of the organization to drive risk down. And that's what we're trying to do here, right, is drive risk down. Um, and, you know, Danny mentioned uh, technology and tools, but the way we look at it, at Mandian anyway, is kind of a trifecta, right? Tools, technology, um, process, and people, right? These are three distinct things that come together, join together to build a functioning security program. So tools and technology, you need to have them, but they're not the end-all, be-all, and they're based on the people and the processes that you have, right? Uh, and use cases and playbooks, a lot of people don't have these. This is kind of getting up into the detection maturity, right? You see that arrow trending upward there? Must be this tall to ride, right? You've got to have a security program, you've got to have security operations capability, incident response capability, you've got to have the technology and tools that support those functions. And once you start uh, thinking about how to mature your processes, you start working on detection use cases and response playbooks. How do you detect the problems, the issues, the risks, the vulnerabilities. How do you um, how do you um, bring in the data sources that are required to make these detections, and how do you respond to these in a methodical manner that incorporates every uh, business unit or individual within your organization that has some kind of relationship to the incident response process? At the very top of this pyramid, we're looking at a hunt program. Right, so there are a lot of things that need to be in place. Hopefully optimally for you to begin hunting. Now, if you have analyst bench time and you want to start hunting for fun in your spare time, that's a great way to start dipping your toes in and um, getting some experience there, getting some exposure to hunting. So, um, for those, by show of hands, who has heard or reads uh, Dave Bianco? Very, very good. For those of you not raising your hands, if you're interested in hunting, he's the guy. Um, so, he's like he's super close to the idiot. He's now for a squirrel, so we're going to be using a lot of his stuff because we steal things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we stand on the shoulders of giants, Danny. No, we steal shit. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on this because I can get mired in, in words. Um, but to give you kind of an, an overall um, an overall idea, um, hunting's pretty new, right? Um, well, for some people it's new, for a lot of us who've been doing it for a long time, just not marketing about a whole bit. So uh, to kind of illustrate this, um, you know, David wrote this uh, sliding scale from level zero through four of what kind of organizations are at which level and might be ready to hunt or not to hunt. Start at level zero, you're pretty much just putting out fires at this point, right? You have an IDS, maybe, um, signature base. It's okay, it's a start, but not really prepared uh, to do any kind of uh, mature hunting. Um, up to level one, which is minimal. Um, now you're like, okay, we might have, you know, the, the IDS tune, uh, our sim tune. Now let's put some intel in. Um, and maybe start actually collecting uh, some of our own data, which is super, super important. Um, up through up through levels uh, two and three, um, now you're starting to create those processes, those procedures. You're not worried about your tools as much because you're getting really good at them. Um, and then your data collection goes way, way up. All the way up to level four, which is you are kind of leading the charge when it comes to hunting. Um, and there's not a lot of companies that are really at that level four maturity. Like they're the ones everybody else is kind of looking to. Um, talking to some of the guys who have been doing this for a while, one of the good examples is the uh, GE search. 
Those guys have been doing this for a very, very long time. If you ever have a chance to meet anybody from GE Cert, pick their brains until I want to shoot them in the face. Um, so that's just kind of the hunting maturity model that we have to put out. All right, cool. So now <clears throat> we want to do this, right? So how are we going to build this, right? Basically, we're going to go back through that pyramid. First thing, executive sponsorships. Your management needs to know what you're doing, what you're going to find, what it means when you find it. Because they want to know, they want a heads up that you're going to find something bad and you're going to tell them about it. And they may have to take that public for compliance reasons, for PII, you know, disclosure reasons, what have you. So they need to know you're doing it and support you. Next, you need to have a logging strategy. You need to have those logs coming in to the right spot. They need to be normalized, parsed, deduped, all that stuff. All right, it's very important that you're getting stuff to the right place so that you can actually use it. All right, same thing as what I just said, right? Algorize it, take it into one place so that you can actually start digging through that data. If it's all over the place, you're going to have a bad time. Make it available within one spot. Make it searchable, right? If it's just in a syslog server sitting on disk and all you got is grep, again, you're going to have a bad time. You got to be able to do something more powerful than that, faster than that. And then lastly, you got to drive maturity, right? You've got some stuff, you've got tools, you can search, you can hunt. Uh, but now you need to start documenting, you need to start making these use cases and start taking these hunts, feeding them off to becoming alerts through automation. So develop use cases, right? Check your data, are you getting the right stuff? Do you have the logs you need to find what you think you should be able to find? If you're trying to look for, for suspicious domains, and you're not getting DNS traffic, right? There's a great spot. You need to get your DNS logs. Review your tooling and associated requirements. Uh, you know, you're going to get, you're going to start, you're going to go, cool, security onion, here we go. I got it on an endpoint. Security onion, I got another one. Well, okay, security onion is working great for us. Well, we've expanded now. We're a team of, uh, you know, 15 people. Is security onion working for us anymore? I don't know. It might be. You might need a tuning, you might need a different tool. You might need some more enterprise uh, level, you know, not as much of the uh, kind of open source. But it's going to depend on you, your program, your team, what you're comfortable with, what your capabilities are. And then lastly, to harp on it again because it's very important, what you find needs to go back into the rest of your program. If you find, you know, malicious actors, how they get in, how can you prevent them from getting in again? Uh, if, you, uh, if you find someone doing something silly, that they shouldn't be doing, then, you know, how can you stop that from happening in the future? How can you, uh, uh, how can you prevent it? Is it policy? Is it education? Uh, you know, how, how can you improve the posture of your overall organization? Yeah. Um, again, and this is another good, uh, good um, illustration of the overview of what your inevitable machine is with hunting. Um, so a lot of times we kind of find ourselves silent, right? It depends. It doesn't really depend on what you're doing. You can uh, just be in your own little microcosm of a group and never talk to other departments, and that sucks, and that's never going to get anywhere. So this kind of illustrates about what that, that end goal is from going from your ongoing hunt missions, feeding that into your IR, right? Um, so they might have enough to deal with already, but if you find something that maybe they didn't hit on, it's important to build, uh, um, build that road with them. Um, and of course, that out, out, um, the IR output uh, affects SecOps, right? That affects your SOC, uh, your guys looking uh, with their eyes on glass, right? They have to um, benefit from the fruit of your labors from IR on down. Um, and then this is really is all about lessons learned. I know documentation sucks, right? You know, nobody wants to do it, nobody wants to write it, but it's super important. And because we don't want to have to make the same mistakes twice. Um, so lessons learned um, after action reports are super, super important. Um, and then um, build that back into your um, your overall detection capability, right? Um, so that you can go back and find newer, cooler stuff. But that all of those have to feed into each other. Thank you. This is so um, there are a couple arrows here. Thank you, Danny. A couple arrows here, right? Evil. She new arrows for me. Yeah, yeah. Evil, evil, and non-evil, right? So uh, we can get into this in a little bit. There are two ways to to look at the hunt um, output, right? Evil and ways for evil to do evil things. So things that negatively affect our security posture and that widen our attack surface. So when we talk about the output of a hunt, uh, when it comes to evil, we pass that to incident response, right? These are the guys that need to handle the issue, triage, and 
um, go through that process. And a non-evil risk, something that is just stupid or uh, risky, needs to go into security operations so they can handle that vulnerability in the in the way that makes sense for the organization. And so on that note, right, there's three things you're going to find in a hunt. You're going to find nothing. That's not bad, right? If you phrase your hunt correctly and you have the right hypothesis, you don't find anything. That means that whatever you were hunting for is not there, right? That That's a good thing. Now, eventually you may need to review this because you might have the not right the, might not have the right data um, or maybe it's not relevant to you your environment right if you have no sequel in your environment and looking for sequel injection you're just not going to find it right it's not relevant to what you got you're going to find non malicious the stupid the ways for evil to do evil things right this is good right you can take this you can apply new policies new procedures in order to mitigate that risk or you're going to find malicious stuff you're going to feed that to your IR team that can remediate it, find those lessons learned, bring them back in again to try and prevent it from happening again. Excellent. So when we talk about um, sorting out data, or we talk about data sources, data sources are critical to the task of hunting. If you don't have the right data, you might as well not hunt. So this is a kind of a set of examples of different types of data that we can integrate to our hunt missions. And you'll notice uh, a lot of pretty tr typical traditional things, right? We want to monitor VPN connections, and we want to monitor DNS, and uh, we want to monitor threat intelligence, whether that comes from inside the organization or um, it was developed internally, uh, internally or externally, right? You can have um, information feed in from multiple places from outside the organization that are going to be really useful. The, the place where I don't uh, see organizations focusing uh, from a threat intel perspective is within the organization, right? There are people performing reconnaissance against your enterprise. This is useful information. There are people talking about you on uh, IRC. That's useful information, right? Your organization is targeted. It behooves you to understand how you're being targeted and what the objectives of these threat actors are, what their motivations are, and how you can integrate that information into your um, hunt operations. Same goes for HR information. We don't see this a lot, right? Guy gets fired, guy or gal gets fired, right? Now, they may have shared their credentials with someone else. They may be coming back into the network to um, steal some intellectual property, get some stuff off of their machine or whatever the case may be. If, if you're not tied into the HR termination workflow from a SOC perspective, you may not know about this. You may not be able to detect this very well. So there are a lot of different sources of information that you can use to uh, generate some really useful detections. And uh, you want to think very broadly about this information and how it can work for you in your environment. I want to talk about events. There are two types of events. There are observed events. These are events that came directly from a system that processed the data that you want to look at. Right? You have a router that passed a connection. Right? It generated a log. That is a observable event. It's an observed event. It came directly from the source. You have things like synthetic events. Um, these were generated through some type of analytic process that was automated. Right? If you have a uh, let's say you have a sandbox at your egress point. Your sandbox uh, popped an alert and said, hey, um, we analyzed this data and there's something that you should look at. You can look at it as an alert or you can look at it as a, as a synthetic event. And then, frankly, guys, there isn't any kind of standardization across the um, industry right now for a lot of these hunt terms. And so these are suggestions for how to look at these. Some folks in the back over here would say that an event is an alert is not a synthetic event, but it could be looked at that way depending on what the source is. What you're seeing here up on the screen, um, that's an Apache log, right? That log on the very top, and these uh, screenshots are from the Fire Threat Analytics platform, if any of you have ever heard of it. Uh, excellent hot platform. Don't want to plug product, but it is really cool, guys. Um, <laughs> I, I got You're to, product agnostic. I got really, to, really yeah, we are product agnostic. I have, to, I have to say that because it is true. If you're not product agnostic, you need to be. It's important. Up here, uh, you see the circle, right? Apache HTTP server. That log originated from uh, the server that processed that client connection. And so that uh, event came from uh, the server. And so it's an observed event. That synthetic event down here, this is an analytic log uh, or an analytic event. It's a synthetic event basically stating that the ratio of sent data to received data for a particular set of events uh, didn't seem right. So it's saying there may be some type of data exfiltration occurring here. It's an anomaly. It's something that uh, we're concerned about. So that's a synthetic event. That's what we mean here. I just want to do some definition of terms so that we can understand what we're talking about here. 
So uh, we have a bro log up here on the screen. If you don't know bro network security monitor, you got to know it's a great, great uh, open source tool. We want to use original source data whenever possible, right? Just like we said, an observed event, something that came directly from the system that processed that, that data. So this is metadata coming from the system that processed the original data. We want to make sure that the right fields are there. So you see all these fields are split out, right? The, the client variables, uh, we have a connection ID that allows us to pivot between different data sources that's specific to the threat analytics platform. But some of the other um, uh, pivot points here are just standard pivot points, right? From an HTTP perspective, you need to know what a, what a status code is for a particular um, session or connection. And uh, you're going to want to potentially stack those and see whether maybe you happen to have a high incidence of 404s. Right? Maybe someone's trying to do something squirrely and they're triggering a bunch of 404s. That's useful information, but you wouldn't know unless you were able to pick that piece of information out of the event, right, and use it as you see fit. Observed events are better than synthetic events unless you're using synthetic events for context, right? Synthetic events are great for context. So when you um, use a hunt platform, you have varying uh, capabilities in terms of enrichment. You may be able to tag an event, you may be able to tag a set of IPs, you may be able to um, add context to specific events. I mean, it really varies in terms of the technology and tools that are out there. Um, but the, the point is, is uh, you generally want to rely on the information that came directly from the source, as close to the source as possible. From a, from a data perspective, again, you've got to be able to pick those, extra, those extractable data points out that, that make sense for you and that are important for you. Ready the spells. Can I pick this one? Hey, my turn again. Um, so, there, uh, can, can you answer the balls? Sure, yeah. All right, awesome. So there's really three main points that I want to hear. Um, you're, depending on the size of your organization, um, even if it's from the smallest one all the way up to you know, a large one, like your bank, for instance, um, it's, it's understanding your network. You have to really focus your energies, and I'm sure this is not anything new for anybody. Um, you have so much data coming in, and we all know data is not intelligent, right? Just because you have a lump of crap doesn't mean you're on diamond day. But so you have to uh, recognize your critical assets, um, and also think, think more Think more broadly, right? Just don't think about your own objectives. Think about how what your content is going to do is going to benefit, um, you know, uh, IR, compliance and audit, the two dirty words, uh, or um, IT operations. And also, you're going to find, uh, you know, you might find a lot of uh, um, parsing, uh, parsing issues, um, duplicate data. You really have to ferret that stuff out. We can't just grab all day, right? That's not, that's not what this is about. Um, so those are uh, those are all ways to uh, to uh, to enrich and contextualize your data set because it's all about context. I never want to see somebody come to me and be like, "Hey, I found this uh, dirty IP address, right? I found it on Twitter. It's awesome." Yeah. Well, why? Why should we block it? Why is it dirty? Um, well, because no one says so. Old joke. Um, <laughs> no, I mean that, that's a true story. I, I had another organization come to me and they had a Intel feed and they said, um, "Just block everything at eighty percent." Okay, why? Oh, because they said so. That's not what we No, it's not how this works. Um, so that's this is that's kind of how you have to get ready for this. So then, right, you're talking about context, right? We want to enrich this statement. We want to or enrich the data that's coming in, right? Maybe we can tag this. Do we know? Do we have asset management? Do we know what our our database servers are? What our web servers are? Um, do we have a set of feeds, right? Intel feeds. Are they coming? You know, external, internal things that we're building or that we've paid for. Um, Let's put the other bullets in. Right? Oh, there we yeah. go. Um, you know, whatever information do we have that we can feed into this system, right? Can we figure out where these IPs are, right? Somebody talking to an IP in California and in Kuwait. This might be interesting. It may not be. Or, you know, maybe they're coming from California and Kuwait. <coughs> maybe more interesting. Um, but putting context to this information that's coming in allows you to make additional informed decisions. And having it there in your platform is very, very helpful. Uh, to be able to especially to say, you know, I've got this guy, he's hitting this IP address over and over and over again. Instead of having to go into yourself and say, who is IP address, if it already will tell you, you know, with some level of confidence what the who is report is for that IP, that's really, really helpful to know immediately, oh, it's, you know, a Cloudflare site for Amazon and it's just refreshing a page, it's not a big deal. 
So, tools, right? We've talked a lot about data. We mentioned tools. Tools and X, right? <laughs> <laughs> I thank you for that. This is my new, I appreciate that. Um, thank Danny. <laughs> just go ahead and do the polls too. Um, so, <laughs> sir, we give this talk twice or it throws me off every time. Um, so, what are, I mean, to our minds, this is probably the, uh, the, the three most important things. Um, you don't want to be waiting for a search to, to run all day. Anybody familiar, uh, I'm familiar, but we're off Go ahead. All right, cool. So, you know, sometimes, you have entire time to go get breakfast while something is running, depending on how quickly your search heads are functioning, the forwarders, I mean, it's not always perfect, right? Um, so ideally, a very rapid search to come back is is amazing. We've gotten spoiled by being an Indian because, our, because the search really went very, very quickly. Uh, but I, mean, I know the struggle of, of having to be slow. Um, stacking, which is really just fancy word for counting, right? You want to say, I want to see what this thing did, how many times it did it, and who it did with. Pivoting. Uh, being able to uh, move laterally through your own data, right? So it's not enough just for me to have a proxy log. I want to, hopefully I have firewall logs, right? So I can pivot to that. Um, ideally, endpoint logs, you know, um, uh, uh, post endpoints, uh, IDS, so you can form a larger picture. And he, Stephen said it earlier, um, nothing is still something, right? If you don't find something, maybe you don't have the right log sources. This is exactly why uh, hunting is important. Um, so, uh, and then, um, as you mature, being able to, um, integrate, uh, Intel, uh, automate stuff, we're gonna, we've already talked about that a ton of time. So, um, this is, these are the keys to really building a functioning hot program. It teaches you sweet dance moves, too. So, obviously, tools. Tools cost money. Maybe. Right? There's a lot of good open source stuff out there. Um, you gotta, you gotta drive these by operational requirements. Well, as I mentioned before, what do you and your team need? Because it's gonna be different for every organization. You have different stuff coming in, you have different needs, different requirements. And so it's very important that when you go through a selection process for your tool, whether it's something you're paying for from a vendor or you're doing an open source with a, you know, Elasticsearch or Elsa or, or, you know, whatever the case may be, that then you take in, into account what you actually need, what's going to work for you. Um, so we put a list here. This is absolutely not all-inclusive. There's some great stuff out there that's open source, it's free. It will scale very well. Um, you just need to design it and work with it correctly. And so it's something to take into account when you are, uh, when you're doing this, going through this process. All right, we can talk about analysis. We can talk about the threat hunting loop. This is uh, another wonderful graphic from the team over at Squirrel. Uh, David Bianco, he's going to hate me for this, but he's a thought leader in the hunting space. Uh, he used to work over uh, with us at Mandiant on the threat analytics platform team and uh, came up with a lot of really good stuff with us and then took a lot of that, went over to Squirrel, stole it. Just kidding. Uh, so we start with hypotheses, right? Things that we assume about our environment, right? For example, we have a policy to not plug USB drives into critical servers. Well, how do we bear that out? How do we make sure that we aren't actually plugging USB drives into critical servers? Right? We form a hypothesis and then we seek to prove that either wrong or right. Once we um, develop these hypotheses, whether they're very broad, broadly scoped or more narrowly scoped, uh, which you'll you'll end up trending that way over time. You'll start with these really broad hypotheses and then start narrowing them down, and we'll talk about what those look like here in a minute. You start investigating using your tools. You start developing new automations for these, and then you work those back into the um, to your platform, to your uh, hunt methodology, to security operations overall. This is a wall of text. We are not going to go over all of this. This is for you to take home. Uh, we'll put up the slides after we get done here today. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to get some ideas from this list that will help you develop a base set of hypotheses about your environment and start thinking about what data sources you need to bring in to detect those and what tools you can use to detect and investigate those. So, so one note on the hypotheses. This is kind of like this is kind of how when I first started doing hunting, I like to phrase a question: Do I see suspicious outbound data transfers? All right. And it's a good way to think about it. I like, I've changed a little bit, and I think this was mostly a function of reading stuff by Bianco, is I like to phrase them as a statement. And I, and I want to say, the statement is, we're doing something right, right? We 
don't plug USBs into critical servers. We, you know, pick one of these off the list, right? We don't have inbound traffic from our DMZ to our internal network. And I want to prove, ideally I want to prove it right, right? I don't want to find that stuff. Chances are I'm probably going to prove that wrong, but I want to start with a statement of I'm going to find that we're doing this right. We're making the right decisions. We're doing the right things. So that's some way, that's how I've uh, started to phrase those. Uh, it's kind of up to you, but I just want to make a, a note on that. So there's Dobby. And uh, so now we're going to talk a bit about uh, about some of the stuff that we found doing this at, at a whole different bunch of different companies. Danny, you want to kind of introduce you? Sure, yeah. Um, so you're, you're going to hear a say the phrase, and we said it already. Um, ways for evil to do evil things versus actual, holy shit, call by our actual evil. Um, and this is was this is probably one of my favorite Twitter accounts to follow up. Should I or people say? Um, like, oh my god, you see Team Viewer? Eh, it's help desk, don't worry about it. You know? He's exact, no, IT uses it. Dameware engineering. And this is the, because we see this all the time. RDP. Oh yeah, that's time. He does it all the time. Okay. Uh, so, um, and, and actually, this, is, this actually leads to the other fun story that we have of, during our, our hunting expeditions of, so one of the biggest threat landscapes, I'm sure you guys know, is out of the software, right? Shitty patch management, no real building management. We went to a client one time and said, hey, look at all the stuff you have in Java that's like 10 years old and you have 80, 80 billion versions of Firefox. And he looks at us with a straight face and he's like, I have a business to run. <laughs> that he, was awesome. He, he, he kind of said it like that though. No. He was very, he was very like emotional about it. Yeah. You know, we're showing him like, you know, Firefox going back to like version one across the whole business, like just totally crazy stuff. It's like Flash, Java, Firefox, super old Internet Explorer from like, you know, 10, 15 years ago. We're like, how could this be? This is like a humongous company. We've all heard of them and they're supposed to be doing the right thing. And, and that's the important part. These yeah. are the conversations that you're going to have with your executives because what we forget a lot of times is they don't know what we know. And you have to try to get it across to them that this is a, that yes, Java on, outdated Java, oh, big deal, go handle it later. Across an entire enterprise, that's that shit. So you have to really try to talk to them in a way that they're gonna understand it. Next slide. So each of these examples we're gonna give, this is all stuff we found, real life environments, different companies, whether it be our own, others that we've consulted with, what have you. Um, they're going to have a couple of different pieces. They're going to have hypothesis, right? Same phrasing. What we found, and then we put some remediation stuff in there. Uh, that's kind of a more you know read at home, uh, but wanted to try and have an opportunity to put some information there um, about you know how we would recommend you know fixing some of these things, right? Just as a uh, to try and give some more information that everybody can take home and uh, and, and learn from. So, go ahead. Dan. Sure. So um, this is one of the catch-alls that we'll always sit down and, and look for. So um, at the very essence of it, you, we can talk all day about process and methodology and documentation, but at the end of the day, you're going to sit in front of a keyboard going, all right, what now? What the hell am I supposed to look for? Um, and the end game is to be able to sit any analyst down through, uh, through your sort of experience and say, here's a bunch of cool stuff you can look for. Uh, RDP, uh, remote access, always, always a crowd pleaser. Um, so the hypothesis is, as Stephen said earlier, um, all of our uh, all of our access is using approved means, and that's him being an optimist. Um, so it could be anything from you're going to find VNC uh, to the production network, which is awesome. Um, RDP to domain controllers from the DMZ. Um, evidence of you know log me and go to my PC. Yeah, Tom's at it again. Um, and then from there, you have to deliver all these recommendations. So. Um, you don't have to. You don't have to go over the recommendations because we're going to be short on time. But you'll notice here, guys, that we didn't uh, put a disposition in here, right? In terms of like evil or a way for an evil to do an evil thing, right? You guys know your environment. You guys know what's acceptable in your environment. You guys know what the risk profile, hopefully more or less, uh, of your organization, what it looks like, and so you know what you can risk accept and you know what you simply can't risk accept and you know what enclaves are more important than others or what data is more important than other and what users are more important than others and so. You'll you'll want to make your own determinations, of course, as to what the disposition is on these. But we left it pretty uh, vague on these slides. So. Data storage. Uh, so the hypothesis is that we're only storing data in places where it should live. Um, 
I see smiles in the audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy, right? But this is a very broad hypothesis. Again, we're 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 having a very broad start point, and then we start to funnel those into kind of some more detailed um, uh, thoughts about specific detections that we can um, enact in our environment. So, some of the things that we found. We found uh, really sensitive corporate data on USB sticks that were infected. So a user's coming over to the machine, he's plugging it in, McAfee's blocking it. We don't care because it got blocked, so nobody's looking at that event. And there's sensitive data on there. And then he comes back the next day and he plugs it in again, and then McAfee blocks it again. And it's like the same thing over and over again. Well, no one cares about this because McAfee said it was blocked. Well, now the guy goes over to another machine that somebody failed to install AV on, and now you have a problem, right? So you got to pay attention to stuff like that. Um, cloud providers, right? If you just run a list of the top 10 or 20 cloud providers out on the Internet and run that through your proxy data or just straight uh, network data, you're going to be really upset. There are a lot of people uploading a lot of weird stuff that you can't quite identify to places where you don't want it and to organizations that you don't have an SLA with. And code repositories is something that we see a lot. Um, developers, they kind of operate with their own mentality. They need to do things the way that they want to do them, and they store data where they want to store it. So we do end up finding that a lot, and that is a risky proposition for an organization that depends on intellectual property to survive. All right, proxy infrastructure. Hypothesis, our proxies are configured correctly. Right, again, very broad. You, you'll narrow these down, right? Because because something much more interesting is going to be our proxies don't allow categorized malicious traffic, right? That's, that's probably a little bit more narrowly scoped, probably a little more realistic. But all in the same light, right? Had a client, we went to him and said, why are you allowing all this malicious, no malicious traffic? What do you mean? We paid millions of dollars for, you know, software of, you know, firewall vendor X, and it's supposed to be blocking and, and doing gateway antivirus. I, I, you might want to go check them out because I can tell you they're not right. This is being allowed, like you know. And that was one nice thing about in this case putting putting a different sensor in, right? We put Bro in because their firewall logs came back and said, you know, it said alert, but they just took that to mean well it was blocked. Either that or they weren't looking at them, which is more likely. A really right? easy way of identifying something like that in your proxy logs is just to look at the ratio of like denied to allows. Yeah, that right? was that was how we originally found it. Is is it was like. A one percent chance or one percent denied traffic out of a firewall, you know, out of a web filter. Like, that's not going to happen in any user environment ever. They're like, but we brought a consultant in from that company, from that vendor, to help us implement this, and they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on proxy infrastructure that was wasted for a full twelve months as money that could have gone back into the security program, right? So some other things, right? Not blocking stuff you say it shouldn't, whether it's executables or or you know whatever the policy uh, says. Uh, or maybe the things we found is not logging enough information, right? There's one big major firewall vendor that doesn't log user agent strings on HTTP traffic, right? User agent is incredibly important to identifying malicious activity in HTTP traffic, but it doesn't log it, period. Does not log it. I have sent requests to them many times, and sorry, I don't have good news to report. Okay, go back real quick. Okay. Um, so that, that last one there, that last discovery bullet, the proxy's not logging the necessary metadata, this is important not just from a hunt perspective, but from a forensics perspective. If you have to investigate an incident six months later, and it was something really bad, and you really need to know what happened, if you're not logging the right field, you might as well not even log and save the data because it's going to be useless to you when it comes down to the, to the critical times. Just so want to make that point. All of our protocols are awesome and secure and approved for use. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody <laughs> said, ha ha. <laughs> That's awesome. Try the deal. Um, so, what have we found? Telnet, FTP, plain text, uh, plain text creds going across um, to, you know, SNMP version 2. Um, IRC, yes, oldie but a goodie, still happening. And this could be something as innocuous. Um, and just caveat here, for being consultants, we don't always get full visibility. We don't know what all the processes are. We just have to use best guesses. So when I see IRC in 2016 in a corporate network, why? Um, it could just be some security nerd on his lunch break under a game server like I've seen. Or it could be uh, an IRC channel that you connect to and it's just a <coughs> T 
2,000 Turkish bots talking to each other. So that's kind of risky. Um, Tor, you guys see it all the time. Um, we see movie downloads, gigs and gigs of movies being downloaded. Uh, you know, that's not really supposed to happen. Um, and so yeah, that's one of the that's one of the greatest things. Proof clients, right? Internet access achieved knowing using known good software, right? This is the question of patch management. Right, we've seen suspicious stuff that you're like, this is related to no browser or you know, app or anything like that I've ever heard of. Or uh, you know, as we mentioned before, you're going back Firefox versions, you know, ten years old that that you should have no place on an enterprise network. Now sometimes this stuff's on a guest wireless, and you're kind of you're kind of hung up, you're stuck. But a lot of times it won't be. But hunting, you know, is a good way. You're gonna find this non-malicious stuff, but it's a good way to validate other things, right? You you now validated that hey patch management may not be working as well as maybe we thought it was right and so it's a good way again feedback into the program to improve that to take back to your your ops teams to say hey look I thought we were patching Firefox you know everyone should be up to you know whatever thirty five or you know, whatever the latest one is outside of the audit cycle yeah outside of the traditional audit cycle right which always comes back with the check in the box <laughs> magic. It's magic, exactly. So those boxes always get checked. I don't know how. <laughs> so uh, privilege management. Um, I put usernames up here, but I should probably read accounts, right? You want to make sure that our accounts are stored the right way, are, are um, standardized the right way, that there's a taxonomy that makes sense for our organization so that we can pick out the things that don't make sense. Right? If, if everyone in your organization is first initial, last name for their user accounts, and you see, like, you know, I don't know, give me an example, Elite Guy 56 like you know that's not a legitimate username, right? Um, there, are, there are different oh, implications wow. here, right? When you start noticing usernames that are kind of outside of spec, there are a lot of different implications, right? You can have service accounts that are shared by different uh, users or used by non-automated processes, right? That's what a service account is for. It's not for a human to use, so you want to make sure that's not happening. Um, you want to make sure that service accounts are only used for one type of service and that you're not reusing service accounts across infrastructure. You've got to have um, some type of specificity to your account taxonomy. So regardless of whether you identify people by a number and say RS, which is the department 54619, and that's a specific user and you know how to track that back in your privilege management, or you simply use a more standard first dot last or first initial last name, you've got to be able to tie accounts back to individual people. You've got to be able to tie them back to individual processes or services. And so that's really important. You can identify that during hunts if different groups within your organization, business units are not complying with the organizational standard. This is really good information to pass back into security operations. We want to make sure that folks are using the proper privilege escalation techniques and that they're not logging directly into machines as root, right? Not a best practice. Uh, could, could uh, you know, make things easier for a threat actor. And uh, it, all of this kind of like stacking usernames in a threat hunting platform or just some type of data analytics process allows you to um, pick out the things that don't make sense and that, that seem a little weird that you want to dig into a little bit more. And then that last bullet there, going back to that HR termination workflow, I love using that example because we had a client who uh, was able to um, take their their provisioning process and take all the users that were terminated from the network and feed that right back into their hunting platform on a regular basis in a relationship with IR, and they were able to find some insider threat activity that would have been disastrous to the survivability of the business. So I, I try to drive that home. There are so many different data points that you can integrate to hunting and kind of come up with some kind of a fusion model that makes sense for your organization. Our laws are going to tell us exactly what we need to know every time to validate our effectiveness. Um, so yeah, we have um, non-security specific appliances. So a lot of times, uh, and even I'm not caught up in this, is only uh, or only audited stuff that I think is supposed to be doing security. And there's other stuff out there, right? So we have uh, you know even stuff like a Cisco ISA, the scan detection, you know, disabled. Yes, it's very very noisy, but should it be disabled? You know, to to a level where it's not going to give you what you need to. No. Um, and probably the biggest one that I, that I want to hit here, and we've seen it a ton of times, is having your sensors in the wrong places. I've seen it so many times where, yes, we know that the site they went to or the resource that they got was evil. There's, there's bad stuff on it. Okay, who did it? Oh, it only says the proxy. I can't trace it back. Okay, is there any X44? No. 
Okay, so let's try to go pivot through some other things. So that's definitely one of the most important ones. We're going to give one more and skip the last one just in the essence of time. Process execution, right? This one's great if you can get your host logs. Sysmon, uh, snare, Windows logging, right? Which has some limitations. Uh, endpoints only execute processes required for business functions, right? Obviously, this is really tough to do on a user environment. In a server environment, much more simple because things shouldn't change all that much, right? We found obfuscated PowerShell. Not generally legitimate activity, right? Mimi cats, right? One time we went in and we're like on a hunch, we're like Mimi cats keyword search. <laughs> Why did this hit? Like, this shouldn't even be showing up in logs, right? We did like a um, joke, like, I'm not going to find this. The background on that was uh, the, the organization that hired us to perform this hunt assessment also had a uh, pen test running at the same time, and the pen testers had far exceeded their scope and installed Mimi Cats on the domain controller. <laughs> Oops! <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, that was interesting. Um, you know, suspicious file names, you get users installing random crapware. Um, you know, the level to which you can do this depends on your level of access controls on your users. If they have admin rights on your box, you know, don't even try on your user environments, servers, but still a good one. I hate to skip over this one. This is yeah, I don't really want to skip over DNS. Um, there was a pretty good talk earlier from uh, from one of the guys from the NSA. Uh, talked about a lot of really cool stuff you can find in there, so I'd go pick up his slides. He had some cool stuff that I was like, you know, like I need to go find out, check out some of the stuff. Um, but you can find a lot of good stuff hunting through DNS logs. Take this up, yeah. Sure. So, uh, thinking ahead, um, what are our goals? What what's what's your justification to your management, which is ultimately what matters, as to why you want to spend cycles spinning up a, um, a hunt program? Um, you want to be able to uh, party your environment. Uh, you want to you want to improve your overall detection monitor. Obviously, you want to find stuff that you didn't see before. Um, and I'm actually just going to skip down the metrics because it's one of the probably most important ones, especially for hunting, because it's really difficult to go to your to your boss and say, hey, I didn't find anything. Awesome, right? No, they're not going to see it that way. But nothing is still something. Another important one is the better you get at this, those instances are going to go up initially. And that's that's something you have to explain to them. As, like, we're getting really good at this. We have a ton more incidents. Doesn't sound right at, uh, at, at first blush. Uh, but they're going to go up before they go down, and that's a good thing, um, as well as giving other metrics like how much time did it take us to find that stuff. Cool. Um, and then we talk about kind of maturing hunt methodology and what that's going to look like in the future. Today we rely on system one thinking. Right? This is really intuitive stuff. This is uh, an analyst who happens to have a network engineering background and notices that something is off about a particular set of packets. Hey, there's been some kind of header manipulation here that I'm not comfortable with. Let me dig into that, right? Or you might have an admin that notices something, a former admin that notices something on a host um, that, that um, seems quite anomalous for this individual based on their experience, right? For the most part, we are in system one thinking today. Most organizations that are building a hot program or have some type of operational hunt program don't necessarily have very formalized methodology for how they go about doing this, right? This isn't uh, quantitative, this isn't empirical, there aren't like systematic um, uh, processes applied to how we go about doing this. We simply look at the data, we manipulate the data in a way that makes it more clear and easy to understand as a human, and then we just apply our uh, experience and judgment and reasoning to it, uh, you know, through the, through the lens of our own experiences, and then we share that with our team and say, hey, do you see what I'm seeing here? Is this kind of weird? And we follow that that down the rabbit hole. We follow the anomaly down the rabbit hole until we can either determine it is a false positive or something evil or a way for evil to do an evil thing, right? To mature this methodology and to get to a point where we're doing this in a much more systematic and repeatable way that allows us to scale teams and do this with a lot more people than we are doing it with today, we need to get to system two thinking. And this terminology is borrowed from, um, you know, uh, Central Intelligence Agency analytic tradecraft, right? This is the way they go about thinking about uh, how to apply uh, analytic techniques to intelligence data. We can apply this type of methodology to hunting as well. We want to investigate the ways that make the most sense for us, that are repeatable, that are consistent, and that allow us to continue with both system one thinking and system two thinking, right? They feed into each other. System two thinking helps eliminate some of the bias that we have. 
all of us here, we all know our environments, right? Um, hopefully. We're hopefully, right? To a certain extent, we know our environments, and we have biases about our environments, right? If we enact a policy that says we don't plug USB into critical servers, we might be under this belief that we really don't do this, and so it's kind of a blind spot, right? When you apply more structured analytic techniques to this problem, you b develop the ability to reduce bias and to eliminate the risk or reduce the risk that is um, that that comes through um, bias analysis um, from a more intuitive standpoint. So, uh, any questions? Uh, that's actually the end of our presentation, and hopefully, this has been useful for you guys. Um, actually, first of all, can I have a show of hands for anyone in the audience that hunts today or has hunted in a way that, uh, you know, kind of matches up with what we talked about here today? Awesome. Nice. Awesome, really awesome, good. awesome. And the second question was, um, oh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> how many of you feel like you got something new from this presentation that you didn't know before? Excellent. Excellent. And we got down Larry. <laughs> that feels really good. There, there was somebody who answered 42 to you just now. Who was that? 42. <laughs> 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 we do have to try. All right, so really cool questions get cool swag. So who's got cool questions? Yeah, uh, so you in first. Um, when you're looking at the hypothesis and you identify that, in your guys' opinion, does it make more sense to have kind of one when you're starting out in hunting to have one that... Uh, you kind of know to be the case that so you know that you should find it versus you just going out there and looking for something. Yes, when you're when you're working on validating your data sources, right? So say you're building your enterprise logging strategy and you think about, say, say you start with critical systems, right? And that's how you're doing your phase plan for making sure that you're getting all the data you're supposed to get. You are going to want to perform some type of validation on that data. And so you have a starter set of use cases, right? Why are you bringing in this data? How do I validate that I'm receiving the right information? And so you would go in with that type of bias to say, I'm looking for something specific. I want to be sure that the data set um, includes the right information to perform that detection. Does that answer your question? Questions? <laughs> dependent on analyst experience, dependent on how close the hunt operation is to security operations and how integrated it is within security operations, right? These organizations have a close relationship and uh, you know the analysts are more experienced or less experienced, they know they can lean on each other. I think that uh, I think that when you start getting up into the into higher uh, levels of maturity, right? You've already built a hunt program and you have adequate resourcing from a personnel perspective. You can start specializing, right? When you have a smaller security shop, everybody wears every hat. The bigger your group gets, the larger your organization, the more hosts or endpoints that you have to be concerned with or critical data, the more you can specialize and start splitting those out. At Mandia, we absolutely have those specializations. We have folks that are very network oriented. I'm very network oriented, very much event log oriented. Then we have folks that are in the host all the time. So what you, what you want to do when you have that type of specialization is that you never want to silo those people. You want them to work side by side and you also want to have them validating each other's findings because they see things from a completely different perspective. All right, cool. I think we're done. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. I really appreciate it. Thank you.